There's this moment when a whole new generation are standing on the verge of a new land, a land filled with future promise of hope. And Joshua says, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things amongst you. We all want to do amazing things for God, but our call is first to consecrate ourselves to God. Then the Lord will do amazing things. Consecrate is the word Kadesh in the Hebrew, which means to declare oneself apart or to prepare one's heart, vision and action towards the holiness of God. Maybe the world has yet to see what God can do through a church, a collective, fully consecrated to him as one people. But it's not about you. It begins with God. He is one. We have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is sovereign over all and working through all and living in all. In a truth-toxic world of council culture and personal outrage, one church is built on our confession. We believe in one God, the Father, the almighty maker of heaven and earth of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one being with the Father. That's the Nicene Creed. On our confession, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. A divided world is looking for a united church. Historically, the catalyst of revival has been the achieving of oneness of mind among a number of Christian believers. On the day of Pentecost, they are in one place and of one accord. Unity is the landing strip for gospel renewal. A.W. Tozer said, The Spirit comes to that company who have, through repentance and faith, brought their hearts into one accord. One is our intentional, earnest commitment to unity. It's a longing for revival, a reformation of heart, a renaissance of culture. The pathway to power lies in the fusion of many souls into one. Unity does not mean uniformity. Unity is celebrating our diversity and our unity. Yet where there is a commitment to one another, despite our differences, there God commands a blessing. Good morning, church. How are you? How are you, world? It's weird looking at yourself on a screen because uh, you realise you're ageing, don't you? You're kind of like, when you get middle-aged, you sort of, your mind starts to settle, but your body starts to ache, doesn't it? We notice that, and your hair starts to gradually uh, recede uh, as well. In fact, yesterday, <laughs> I, find my, I was in Liddles in Hailing Island. Love Liddles. And I found myself in the middle aisle and looking at gardening equipment. But the problem was, I was actually enjoying myself. <laughs> you know you've arrived. I was looking at those gardening clogs and thinking, they look comfortable for £7.99. Anyone else felt that this week? Yeah, I think it's an age thing. Is anyone feeling old like me? <laughs> I was uh, chatting recently with a, an 85-year-old, and this is true, and he said, the other day, <laughs> my wife shouted out, come upstairs, let's make love. And he responded, I can't do both, love. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone, no hands on that one? No, yeah, that wasn't me, but I could, any, oh, no, no names. <laughs> I was in Devon uh, uh, during the Easter break and um, just watching the, the service from afar in the 70 mile an hour winds there. And uh, it's amazing, the church, isn't it? Like, you know, we can get so close to activity, to service, to wonderful youth work and children's work and get given a cup of coffee every week and people smiling. They make to smile every week when, you, when they welcome you here. And it become real over familiarity, can't it? But we're... When you go from a distance and you look back on the church, and this church here, I, I went to a few churches, you know, this church is amazing. Did you know that? It really is amazing. Sometimes we have to step back to see the quality of what God is doing through you, the people of God. Say to the person next to you, you are amazing. 
You're amazing. It's not me being an American and bigging you up. I know it comes natural for us, hard for us British. Yeah, you're amazing. <laughs> I love this comment. Um, <laughs> you enjoyed that. You, you needed that this morning. Just a little lift, a little facelift of, of positivity, okay? Let's get deep. A.W. Tozer. Oh said this, what is needed desperately today is prophetic insight. Scholars can interpret the past. It takes prophets to interpret the present. Learning will enable a man to pass judgment on our yesterdays, but it requires a clear gift of seeing to pass sentence on our own day. 100 years from now, historians will know what was taking place religiously in the year of our Lord. But that will be too late for us. We should know right now. What is God doing amongst us right now? I remember just over three years ago, sitting in the foyer, and we were with our team, praying about where God was going to lead us as a church and as a body. And we felt this word, that God was going to make us one. Isaiah 43 says, do not be afraid, for I'm with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather them from the west. I will say to the north, give them up and the south. Do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone called by my name and created for my glory, whom I've indeed formed and made. A few months later, we entered into COVID. <laughs> what was the grand narrative of that time? The grand secular narrative of that time was division, skepticism, and fragmentation. COVID did many things, but it fueled fear. Fear fueled distrust, which fueled skepticism, which produced fragmentation and disunity. Someone said psychologically, it may even be worse than war, because at least in a war you've got a common enemy and you unite behind a cause. We had economic division, the rich got richer, the poor got poorer, nothing changed there. Generational anxiety. The Z's missed many key milestones in their lives. Political division. Five prime ministers in just seven years. That's quite good going, isn't it? Who wants to be prime minister next? Could be someone in this very room. <laughs> Silas, was that a hand up? <laughs> yeah, he, I reckon you could do it. He could do it. English, German blood, yeah, he would rule well. Division in families. Marriages that were... On edge, tipped over into the abyss. Divisive truth claims. We still live under this fog of fake news, conspiracy, personal outrage, and council culture. How many people do you know right now who are still sitting on an ocean with no wind in their sails because they've become... Skeptical, disillusioned, nihilistic. In other words, they don't believe in any form of truth anymore. Romans says this, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. What would God do in a society and culture that was fragmenting, he would make his people one. The renewed wineskin, I believe, for the next decade is counter-cultural unity becoming one because that is attractive to a world that is pulling all the bricks down off of the wall. Do you believe that? Unity must be intentional, though. You've heard me say this on, on growth track so many times. You know, my wife and I, we're so different. 
she's an extrovert, I'm the introvert. No, I'm the extrovert, <laughs> she's the introvert. I have Anglo-Saxon overlord complex. I have to apologise all the time for our history. She's Latino. She never apologises. She's still seeking reparation from the conquistadors. <laughs> I love loud music. She likes silence. Even in the car going to hailing yesterday, we were fighting over on, off, on, off the music. All I wanted to listen to was Radiohead, then The Cure. She was having none of it. None of it. <laughs> I like sushi. She likes vegetarian options. That's right. She's my first love. Her first love is Brad Pitt. You know that already. <laughs> I mean, it's a source of personal pain for me, so I've mentioned it three times, and on growth track every time everyone joins the church. But the powerhouse behind our diversity and inclusivity, give you some key words there, is our unity, <laughs> but not just any unity. It's a unity in Christ. You can imagine a relationship with Christ like a triangle. On one side, you have Viviana, Marcella, Salamanca, from Argentina, the bottom of the triangle. On the other side of the triangle, you have Matt, Kent, Warren, with all our good, bad, ugly history. And at the top of the triangle, you have Christ, because he's the center. The more we center our lives towards Jesus and his love, which is an agape love, which means unconditional love for his people, the more from each side of the diverted triangle, we gather together, we actually become deeper in something called phileo love. Our, our friendship grows as well as we push towards Christ-like unity. I can honestly say today, after 24 years of marriage, 25 years in October, be a landmark time for us. <laughs> we are better friends. Yeah, we're lovers, but we are better friends than we were 24 years ago because of the magnet, the true north at the top of the triangle which is drawing us together. If we don't have Christ-centered unity, we start to, instead of coming towards the apex, we start to go out. And you know where we land? We land in our families of origin and the sin patterns that so entangled them. And that's been one of the sad points, hasn't it, of the last few years, watching people lose their Christ-centeredness and move out towards their families of origin, thinking that that could somehow save them. Family can't save you guys. Only Christ can save us. And I love family. I love happy family. This is a family church. But Christ must be the apex a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love will become the great evangelistic tool the world has ever seen. So today's talk is called Provocative the first sexual revolution. Sex had to be consensual and covenantal in marriage. 
In a time where there was so much abuse of power, confusion around gender, literally women and children, families, they flocked to the church. Do you remember that one? <laughs> they were financially radically generous. Acts 2, 44 said they sold property, shared possessions and gave to all those who were in need. The direction of our money leads to the direction of our heart, doesn't it? It leads it. But number three, they practiced nonviolence. They forgave and loved their enemies amongst an atmosphere of persecution. They literally laid down power and practiced sacrificial love. When the great epidemics hit the Roman world in the first and second century, the God men, the Caesars, fled, didn't they, to Asia Minor. But when they fled and did a runner, Christians moved into the cities and nursed the dying and the sick, and many of them losing their own lives. The world thinks this, doesn't it? The way back, the way to get back lost time is we've got to self-promote. We need power. We need power. We need to make it. We need drive. We need, like Nietzsche, to say, thus I willed it. I pushed myself to the front of the pack. In fact, there are thousands of masterclasses now on self-promotion. How to promote yourself. Here are a few of them. The art of self-promotion. Six ways to get your work discovered. How to self-promote without being seen to (laughs) self-promote. That's a good one. How to be a narcissist without people thinking that I'm a narcissist. (laughs) That's a really good one. Shameless self-promotion. So there's shame somehow in our promotion. This is my favorite one is 40 ways to self-promote without being a jerk. How about that one? That's pretty good, isn't it? And we have this sort of pull within us, don't we, to kind of, we want to self-promote, but we also feel like there's a disease within that. You know, 50% of teenagers want to be celebrities, don't they? That's what the polls say. And when asked, what kind of celebrity? I mean, it's okay to celebrate people. Did you know that? It's actually all right to celebrate excellence and success, but they said it just doesn't really matter what, as long as we become celebrities. They have a whole world just trying to self-promote on Instagram or on social media. I really like this Banksy picture. How good is that? It's great, isn't it? Nobody likes me. Has anyone, come on, let's be honest. Has anyone tried to self-promote, put something on Facebook or Instagram and been like, oh, no one responded, no comments. Raise your hands after three. One, two, three. There's a two honest people in the church. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Like, oh, no comments. Or, or how about just serving in the church, sacrificing yourself and serving? And no one says thank you. And we're like, oh, we go like into Banksy's child of discontent and self pity. Where we start crying, no one thanks me. There we have this fallen state of saying, I need some kind of affirmation, I need power in order to get where I need to go. Max Weber said this, you cannot express power and love at the same time. They are diametrically opposed. I agree with that. How many people have seen in relationships, in marriage, the dad or the mum giving their all, sacrificing, giving themselves emotionally, their blood, their sweat and tears to save, to keep the family together and the partner has decided to just ride off into the sunset like John Wayne. One has chosen sacrificial love. The other has chosen a kind of freedom with no restraints. It sounds even enticing, but that's power. Philippians 2 says this, and this is our verse for the day. Jesus emptied himself out of power so that he could express love. Imitating Christ's humility. Therefore, we should close our eyes as I read this out. Father, just minister into our spirits and our hearts because we don't want secular views and doctrine to shape our church. We don't want them to come into the church in any way. We want to be shaped by the humility of Christ. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ... If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, 
If any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the mindset of Christ Jesus, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking on the very nature of a servant, And being made in the human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Of the Father. Amen. Amen. How much power does a servant exercise? Doulos means in Greek, which is slave. None. The ruler of the universe emptied himself out. Sometimes people say, I love Jesus, but I hate church. Have you ever heard that before? Church is full of dysfunctional people. They're right. The church is full of dysfunctional people. They're dysfunctional as well, but they just haven't become aware of their dysfunction yet. We gather to work it out, to say sorry, to shape one another's lives. Another myth you hear is people say, I just love everybody. I don't take sides. That's a power statement because you're in control of who you choose to love. Love makes you vulnerable. You have to come down. You have to get into the trenches. You have to cover people's weaknesses. You have to use your strengths towards lifting up people who will give you nothing in return. You have to cover each other's blind spots. What, blind, what, do you, what is your blind spot? Well, you shouldn't put your hand up because you don't know what your blind spot is. But the person behind you knows your blind spot. The person on your side knows your blind spot. Everybody knows your blind spot except from you, right? That's why we need one another. Love makes us vulnerable. There's a difference between power and authority. Power is the ability to coerce people. You do what I say because I force you to do it. You know, in the old days, in the old days, I used to be in a band. And our music band would travel around Europe. And every time we would cross the English Channel, or La Manche for the French, we would arrive on the border and control. And every time, the police would pull us over. Is it? They got something against us? The English, a group of young people in a dodgy looking van. They put us over. Why do we stop? Because the French police, and like the English police, have handguns. Yeah, they have Glocks. And usually one in the pack has a machine gun as well. And then they usually have growling German shepherds around the van as well. German shepherds meaning the dog, not shepherds from Germany. It wasn't like we gathered people, German people from Bavaria, and they are shepherds. No, the dogs. We pull over (laughs) because they've got power. All we want is to gig some cheese, some wine, some saucisson. Who knows what saucisson is? Dried cured sausage. Say to the person next to you, saucisson. It's an important... Oh, you... It's a difficult one. That's a tongue twister. Saucisson. Just sausage. Dried out. (laughs) You absolute linguist, you. Oh, absolutely capital. Brilliant. (laughs) 
But that's power. Jesus had something more than power. He had authority. The people, it says in Mark 1, were amazed at his teaching because he taught them with one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. How to get authority? Authority is achieved through sacrificial love. My wife doesn't have much power, you could argue. She's just over five foot something. I bet she would struggle to pick up one of our three teenagers now, probably. But my wife has authority because she would give her life a thousand times over for any of our kids. And that sacrifice that you mums and you parents have here over a decade for your children or two gives you authority in the long run. Parents, even though I know you think you have none because your, your children are teenagers like mine. I get that. Like, like, Dad, you suck. I understand. But over the long haul, I promise you, you will have authority. A really well-known social activist said this, everybody wants authority without paying the price first. What I do gives authority to what I say. Self-promotion before sacrifice leaves you naked and exposed. Don't be eager, young people, to self-promote. Do the work. If you want to be a musician, don't be eager to be on stage. Do the work. Practice. Don't be eager to start a business up too soon. Get the training. Get the apprenticeship. Do the work. In, in, in marriage, let's not just leave our, our relationships to finding a four-leaf clover on a holiday in Ireland. Let's, let's do the work. Let's lay our lives down for one another. Let's work towards the apex, apex with Christ at the centre. The introduction is finished. Five minutes. <laughs> How do we build provocative love? We have to get revelation that God loves us extremely. Amen. That's where Philippians starts. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, God doesn't pity you. He loves you extremely. To please God, says C.S. Lewis, to be a real ingredient in the divine happiness, to be loved by God, not merely pitied, but delighted in as an artist delights in his work, as a father delights in his son, it seems impossible, a weight or burden of glory which our thoughts can hardly sustain. But so it is. He loves us extremely. If you have any common sharing in the Spirit, the Spirit of God made us alive in Christ. When we were dead in our transgressions, it woke us up. The Spirit has made us have a spirit of adoption. We're now sons of the living God. We can cry out, Abba, Father. We have been filled by the Spirit with gifts Gifts of wisdom and knowledge and healing and miracles and discernment and prophecy and tongues and interpretation of tongues and helps and administration and grace and ministry and service and teaching and encouragement and leadership and mercy, to quote all 18. God has infused his people with sonship. He's made us alive. He's poured gifting over us. God's love has been lavished over his people. And from that standing point, we can go and change the world, can't we? He loves us. There's an energy about knowing God. You know, when you hang around with optimists, like two optimists, Chris and Ben, right there. I love optimists. Esther's an optimist. Sarah thinks she's an optimist, depending on how connection's going, but yeah. <laughs> what do you feel? You feel optimistic. Because there's an energy about the, the lift someone who's struggling with their art form that week or having a bad week. And when you're around someone that's full of self-pity, how do you feel? You feel tired and you, need, you get drained. That's why the center point 
of the triangle is Christ's love. He, he lavished it on us. How can Paul say, who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. How can you even speak like that? No one speaks like that. You can only speak like that if you know that God's grace and God's love has been lavished over us. It's incredible, isn't it? But it's also sobering. To be loved extremely leaves us also in a place where we go, oh, we need more of Jesus, don't we? The pathway to real power, number two, is to cultivate humility. He says, do nothing. This is one of those commanding statements again. It's not like, we'll work it out. Like, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. What's vain conceit? You ever rocked up to you know, church one day? Oh, I've just been one of those weeks struggling with vain conceit. It's like, it's like where did that word come from? <laughs> Basically, it's struggling with self-promotion and my own glory. That's what it means. Rather, in humility, value the person next to you above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each towards the interests of others. The biggest challenge for us in the West is we're driven. And we have been shaped by a stepping stone culture, not a stepping down culture. We kick our, our kids, well, I hope you not kick them, into primary school, into preschool. You, you gotta be, this is just a stepping stone to primary school, child. This is just a stepping stone to secondary school, child. College, that's just a stepping stone to university or to an apprentice, child. You got a job. This job, no one wants to employ anyone anymore because they think they're going to be used as a stepping stone. This job's just a stepping stone to I get a better position, to I can promote myself a bit more. We live in a stepping stone culture, not a stepping down culture. There's two problems with this. If we're in a stepping stone culture, we will step on people. We won't give our lives for people. Naturally, the outcome is to step on people. The other problem is this, is that we'll never be fully present in the moment of where God has called us to be. God wants to be with us in the moment where he's called us to minister. I love what Jesus said. Crazy statement, consider the lilies. <laughs> I mean, who says, like, is Jesus some sort of transcendental florist? What's wrong with him? But consider the lilies. Like, where does that come from? It's because Jesus is saying... Like, slow down, like, don't step up, step down. Like, have you had time just to slow down and consider the lilies? Have you had time in your time at school or college to not think about tomorrow? That will take care of itself. But it's like, in this moment right now, God is going to be fully present with me. Don't worry about what's to come. Know that God right now, young people, He's going to be fully present in your space with you. So much of life is about who am I going to become, where am I going? And Jesus is saying to you, don't self-promote young people. He's saying, step back, sacrifice, empty yourself out. And when you empty yourself out, he can fill you back up with purpose, work, career. But the way you change your, the world is through Stepping down. It's not right, Jack. Step down and then don't worry. God's got you. He's got your future in mind, yeah? Oh, God's so good. God's so good. You build provocative unity. It's in the red by one minute. By building community beyond the safety of ourselves. You've got to fight for unity. You've got to be on guard. Some people, they love people more than Jesus loved people. That's the absolute truth. Some people are more than happy to drive the school bus to hell as long as no one gets upset. That is not biblical. 
Unity is like a toddler. I think I've got a picture of Elliot. It's, unity is like a toddler. It's precious. He's cute there, isn't he? I know, I know. He takes after his mum. He's, he wants to become a rapper. Uh, like Eminem. Uh, no, no, that's a bad role model. Uh, uh, like Run the MC. No one knows who they are. It's in the 80s. Uh, anyway, I don't know what that is either. <laughs> Unity is so precious. You have toddlers in kids' shops. They're precious. Unity is tender. It's fragile. It has a sense of innocence and purity to it. It always hopes. It looks for the best in things. What I love about toddlers is they have a spirit of wonder, don't they? Unity has a spirit of wonder. And we can lose it so easily. That's why we have to be on our guard against the Satan schemes. Titus says, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these have no gain. They're useless. Warn a divisive person once, then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful and are self-condemned. Unity has to be guarded and fought for like a toddler. Bonhoeffer, who gave his life and went back to confront Hitler in Nazi Germany, he was a German pastor. He, he saw that the church was getting hollowed out by the Nazification of Germany. And he started something called the Confessing Church, a new church. And he writes on unity. He was actually strung up right at the end of the war for being in England, going back to Germany. He says, I can't critique from a distance. I need to be there with my people. What a powerful testimony. He says this, hold your tongue. Refuse to speak uncharitably about your Christian brother. The discipline of holding your tongue. That's difficult, isn't it? There's so much to criticize, isn't there? Like, I mean, where do you start, people, right? <laughs> you start by holding your tongue. Cultivate the humility that we like Paul, are the greatest of sinners and can only live in God's sight by grace. I love you. It's like with our own children. I want to direct you. I want to put guardrails around you. There will be discipline. But I discipline them with a spirit of complete grace because I know I am the chief of all sinners. Refuse to consider your time and calling so valuable that you cannot be interrupted to help with unexpected needs. No matter how small, menial. Bear the burden of your brothers and sisters in the Lord, both by preserving their freedom and forgiving their sinful abuse of that freedom. Wow. That's why it's got to be centered on Christ. We have to understand that Christian authority is characterized by service, listen up, and does not call attention to the person who performs that service. We have to guard our unity. It's fragile. As the band come up, we need to abandon, in conclusion, low expectations. The pathway to real power is emptying yourself. We said right at the beginning of the talk, this, love and power are diametrically opposed. Do you remember that? So here's a, quish, a question for us to wrap up with. Who was the most powerful human being who ever lived? Jesus. How did he walk with such power? He did it by emptying of himself his prerogative, his right to power, and became a servant, completely, listen up, dependent on the voice of the Father. Acts says that he was anointed, full of the Holy Spirit, with power, and he went around doing good and healing, casting out devils, because God was with him. You think about all the wisdom, all the miracles he could achieve, because 
he lent in to the fact that the Father was with him. He could hear the voice of God. We today have the same opportunity as Jesus. There is not one thing he couldn't do. There's not one thing we can't do if we depend on the Father. Very true, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what the Father sees him doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. By giving up his power and glory, he had more authority than any of us who refuse to give up our small quests for power and glory. Never, church, dishonor God's faithfulness with low expectations. Empty yourself out. Be filled with love extremely. Cultivate humility and build community beyond the self. This is a crossing over moment, isn't it, for us as a church? Next week, we're going to celebrate. But this is a Joshua moment for us. You know, we need to consecrate ourselves to the Lord. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things amongst you. Fragmentation is tiring, isn't it? It's tiring to be, when we go through transition, maybe you've gone through personal ones, maybe you've gone through division within your organizations, business, work, church, maybe you've gone through moments of fragmentation personally, but it's tiring. It's, it's really it's tires you out. Sometimes I just get, I like change, by the way. I instigate change, apologies. Uh, but I find it tiring as well. Mentally tiring. Some of you, just over the last few months, have been grieving because you've lost a friend. Um, it's tiring when you grieve. And all I can say is invite people you trust, community, and invite the Holy Spirit into your grief today, okay? Some of us are going through grief because we've had to make positive decisions to grow and go forward. There is no growth without change. There is no change without loss. And there is no loss without grief. And there is no grief without pain. Growth equals pain. But it's still tiring. (laughs) And God is saying to you today, he's going to give strength back to you who are weary. He is going to increase power to those of you who are weak. If you are a young person and you are tired, worn out, if you have stumbled and fallen because of your own sin, God will bring hope in the Lord and renew your strength. You will soar on eagles' wings and you will run and not grow weary. You will walk and not be faint. Is that you? Are you weary? I get weary. I need to tap into the Holy Spirit. We can create a space as we sing this song down the front here today. And the answer for so much is just getting filled with the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Saying, God, I step into the river. This is a river, and I'm weary. Is your mind weary? Step into the river and receive the Holy Spirit. Are you struggling with bitterness? Maybe that's you. You're a holder. You know, I'm not a holder, actually. Uh, I've got other problems and sin in my life I need to deal with. But some members of my family are holders. You know, we struggle with that. We hold on to stuff. Oh, I remember in 1972 that you stood on my foot. We're like, anyone a holder here? That's okay. I don't want to, you know, dish you for that. Like, but it's dangerous. Bitterness is a dangerous thing. Hebrews 12 says, see it that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no one, no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and to defile many. When we hold on to bitterness and unforgiveness, it defiles us, but then it defiles our family. It defiles the people in our community, in our close ones. So many times in life, God is throwing you a life jacket. (laughs) Are you like one of those, like the guy I mentioned earlier, who just kind of, you're on your boat, there's no wind in your sails, and you're like just, God's throwing you a life jacket. He's sending people with counsel to speak to you. He's sending community around you to minister to you, but you can't, so you can't receive it. Because your, your mind is on bitterness. Have you ever been like that? Like, no, I, I know you're loving, you're trying to love me, but I reject you. I can't take counsel because I'm angry, I'm bitter. God is saying today, 
let it go. Forgive people. Release people. We're people of the resurrection. We're consecrating ourselves, aren't we, today? For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things. Consecration, as I said before, is that word Kadesh, which just means to set yourself apart, to set your mind, your heart, your action towards the, the holiness of God. He's holy. He's set apart. He doesn't have our agenda. He, he's holy. He's set apart. But he's comforting. He's tender. And he wants to meet with you. Should we stand to our feet? Is that maybe you today? Don't miss out the opportunity if you're weary. Don't miss out on that opportunity if you're tired. If you're holding on to bitterness, today's the day. Release it to God. And if you don't know Jesus today, come forward and receive Jesus. Say, Jesus, from today and this moment on, I am yours. Father, thank you for your church. We declare release right now in Jesus' name. The power of the Holy Spirit. We draw a line in the sand and we step into our future. Thank you, God, you love us extremely. Thank you, God. We release bitterness, broken relationships. We say, well, I forgive you. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Draw us in. Draw us in. Does anyone need any prayer? Just come forward. Let's just pray. It'd be great just to pray for the youth as well. So take our confidence of God over their lives. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. As they sing, let's just come to God. Come to God.